Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back here among friends and comrades. There were many things wrong and curious about Biden's Summit for Democracy, but one of the more egregious indicators, in my opinion, is how backwards uh, of how backwards it all was, was uh, demonstrated through the participation of Yoon Suk-yeol, current president of South Korea. I put together a little slideshow today to help keep us a little more entertained than maybe just my face can do. So if you just give me one moment. All right, thank you. As I was saying, I want to share a little bit about the state of so-called democracy in South Korea today and how a new rise in neo-fascist forces there is deeply connected to the U.S. war drive against China and the DPRK, or North Korea. Just last weekend, some 20,000 people attended rallies and a pan-national conference in Seoul denouncing President Yoon and demanding his resignation. This is only the latest in a constant stream of popular demonstrations, strikes, and denunciations that have been defined that have defined Yoon's administration, which has not even completed its first year. The most recent outpouring of public opposition was sparked by a recent deal struck between Yoon and the Kishida government in Japan regarding the payment of reparations to survivors of Japan's forced labor program in World War II. In the 1940s, some 5 million Koreans were conscripted to work in Japan's mines, factories, and railroads. For the last several years, Japan and South Korea have been locked in a trade war that began when the South Korean Supreme Court ordered Japanese companies to pay reparations to surviving victims of this forced labor program. In clear violation of his constitutional authority, Yoon has ignored this ruling by South Korea's highest court, and announced a new plan for Korean companies to pay these Korean victims of Japanese colonialism, thereby letting Japan off the hook for paying for or even acknowledging its crimes. But what is the real reason behind these moves? The answer lies in Washington. For decades, South Korea and Japan have been allies of the US, but not allies of one another. For a very long time, Japan and the US have been parasitically benefiting from the immense size of South Korea's military, which is technically under US operational control. And since World War II until very recently, Japan was constitutionally prevented from having its own military. So in effect, South Korea shouldered the burden of the US dominated security arrangement in Northeast Asia. The situation is now shifting in the face of a rising China and a nuclearized North Korea. Japan has been given the green light to rearm, and in the next five years will pour $315 billion into its military. South Korea is also being encouraged to develop advanced weaponry like a space force and a blue water navy. All this is to augment the U.S.'s own position. These developments are being encouraged in the context of U.S. antagonism against the DPRK. The aim is to use war against the DPRK as a ramp towards war on China, and to keep Korea divided and therefore the South in a tight military alliance with the United States. The final piece of the puzzle is to bring South Korea and Japan into a formal alliance with one another. Once this is achieved, the US will be able to deploy Korean troops to fight throughout Asia and even send Japanese troops into Korea. In other words, the United States is preparing a grand army to fight its coming war on China. US Secretary of the Army Christine Wormout openly stated as much this earlier this week, I quote, if we are going to go to war with China, we will not do it alone, but with allies. In this arrangement, Koreans will conveniently do the majority of the fighting and the majority of the dying on behalf of Americans. Koreans in the South are well aware of what is going on. The UN administration is making this very obvious. Since last year, the number of joint war games between the US and South Korea has dramatically increased. Many of these war games also now feature the participation of Japan, the most recent being in February, a photo of which is demonstrated here of several naval ships uh, conducting a mutual exercise. <clears throat> and in March, two sets of war games also occurred in Korea. The first was Freedom Shield, which were the longest uh, military exercises the US and South Korea have ever conducted together, lasting 11 days in total. A second set of naval exercises began last week with the arrival of a US naval strike group featuring the USS Nimitz, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier pictured here. During these war games, the U.S. also conducted simulations of nuclear deployment to Korea. The labor movement in South Korea has taken up the task of opposing these war games. 
Last fall, South Korea's two biggest trade unions, the KCTU and the FKTU, signed a joint statement with their sibling trade union in North Korea opposing U.S. war exercises. This brings me to the question of internal repression in South Korea under Yoon, which, as I hope I've made clear, goes hand in hand with the U.S. drive for a new war in East Asia. This January, the National Intelligence Service of South Korea raided the offices of the KCTU's headquarters, as well as its metal workers and construction unions. Multiple organizers and union leaders were charged under the anti-communist national security law and accused of being spies for North Korea. Members of the Korean Peasants League and reunification organizations like the June 15th Committee were also targeted with similar charges. This is a move straight out of the playbook of South Korea's fascist dictatorships, the use of anti-communism and accusations of sedition to repress the labor movement. The aim is very clearly to isolate the most militant sector of the workers' movement from the wider opposition against Yoon, and as, as has long been the case, the class war in South Korea is connected to and a component of a broader international war that is playing out in the Korean peninsula between the forces of imperialism and socialism. But the political significance of Yoon's labor crackdown also needs to be appreciated from this angle of US war on China. The KCTU is a serious source of political opposition to Yoon's pro-US military agenda, and its labor organizing is also a considerable threat. Earlier this month, the UN administration proposed a plan to expand working hours from 52 hours a week to 69 and even 80 and a half hours a week. Demonstrated here is some data from 2021, which already demonstrates the immense uh, length of work hours in South Korea in comparison to OECD nations. Massive public backlash forced this, the UN administration to walk back this plan for a 69 hour work week, but this is probably not the last that we'll hear of such proposals. Internal characteristics of South Korea are a big part of this push. Decades of neoliberalism have left workers swimming in debt and hit women particularly hard as they are overrepresented in part-time and sub-minimum wage jobs while shouldering the overwhelming burden of domestic worth. Constantly, uh, consequently, birth rates have been falling for decades and the population has been aging over time. These proposed increases in work hours are one part of an attempt to combat these demographic realities, not by improving the lives of workers or working women in particular, but by squeezing more from workers for capital. There is also an international dimension to this push. Since the Korean War, South Korea has been an incredibly important site in the development of international supply chains dominated by U.S. monopoly capital. Today, it is under increasing pressure to delink its economy from both Russia and China, as well as to assist the U.S. in constructing a new supply chain of computer chips that excludes China and would therefore allow the U.S. to ramp up its aggression without facing consequences in its tech sector. These moves are proving to be quite deadly for South Korea's economy. South Korea has posted a trade deficit for the past 12 months in a row. This is an obvious part of the reason why South Korea's bourgeoisie is so eager to crank up working hours. Over time, the subordinate position of, that the U.S. is forcing South Korea to adopt will only increase the bourgeoisie's desperation, and attacks on workers in South Korea will likely only escalate. As a final point, given today's date, I need to acknowledge a parallel between the efforts of the Japanese government to erase its historical crimes and the efforts of the UN administration to also erase atrocities from Korean history related to the Korean War. Tomorrow, April 3rd, is the anniversary of the Jeju Uprising, an insurrection that began on the island of Jeju in 1948 against U.S. military rule and the solidification of, South of Korea's division through the formation of South Korea as a separate government. With the support, knowledge, and oversight of the United States military, South Korean police and military slaughtered between 30,000 and 80,000 people on Jeju over the next several years. All this happened before the start of the Korean War. Since coming into office, the UN administration has removed mentions of the Jeju massacre from history textbooks. The anti-democratic and anti-human agenda of the UN administration primarily serves the interests of the US, which is trying to keep South Korea in its orbit against the current of history. What is at stake in the struggle of South Korea today is the question of the peninsula's future, the question of whether Korea will build relations of peace and cooperation within a multipolar world as a united and independent country, or whether it will remain a divided nation with a dependent appendage of U.S. capital reigning in the South and a base for U.S. military power projection in Asia. In order to preserve South Korea's position in its empire, the U.S. is blessing a backwards and regressive government with no popular mandate. Today in South Korea, law is not an instrument for justice for the many, but a flexible weapon of tyranny wielded by the few. Where Korean people demand peace, their government offers war. Where they demand justice for colonial crimes, the UN administration offers humiliating capitulation and historical erasure. 
And where workers demand dignity for labor, the state brandishes the whip at Wall Street's behest. This is democracy under capitalism and US imperialism, democracy for the bourgeoisie and imperialists, and dictatorship for the workers. It is probably not so different than what many of you listening today face in your own countries. And that is why, as a final note, I want to emphasize the urgency of international solidarity with all of Korea, from workers in the North who are fighting to defend their country and uh, from the constant threat of U.S. war, to workers in the South fighting a barbaric capitalist regime whose crimes are whitewashed by capitalist media. As I've often said before to this audience, Korea is a major battleground in this coming war against between the U.S. and China, and the success or failure of Korea's anti-imperialist struggle will help set the course faced by the rest of the world. As a final plug, if you happen to be in New York City, on April 29th, Noruto, in collaboration with the June 15th Committee, will be hosting a human chain event connecting the UN offices of North and South Korean governments. This is happening April 29th, Saturday at 11 a.m. If you would like more information, uh, please follow up with uh, Noruto through our social accounts or through our other uh, means of communication. Thank you.